Okay, so um, seems like a lot of the people that I've been running into lately have been suffering a form of sadness, anything from sadness to what we consider to be clinical depression. And um, oh, it looks like Okay, we're recording, okay. <laughs> and so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, depression, whether it's from severe, moderate, or, or mild depression. Um, the Bible gives us the answers for everything that goes on in our life. The Bible is the blueprint that God has given us to live our lives. And um, so there are answers for everything that we have questions for. And I've had um, counsel with people lately where either I'm counseling with a person that is depressed or I'm counseling with the person who is causing depression and depression can come from several different areas in our lives um, it can be caused by certain things and we'll discuss those things and um, we're mainly going to discuss uh, from the Bible we're going to discuss uh, an event that happened that uh, in the life of uh, Elijah the prophet and um, how that he went from his greatest victory to his lowest low, clinically depressed. And um, as Christians, we should be aware from looking historically, as we will be, we should watch out that in those occasions where we see our highest victories, those are the occasions when we're wide open to be slammed with depression. And, um, of course, many of us over the past couple of years, we've gone through some, some events in our lives. We've gone through sicknesses and we've lost loved ones and uh, the economy and just everything else I've I read a statistic that stated that one in ten patients that go to the doctor are clinically depressed. But that was that statistic that I found was before the economy slumped. So I would dare say that that number has jumped quite a bit since then. I would dare say that maybe one in five to one in six patients that go to see the doctor are suffering at least a mild form of clinical depression. And as I said, we'll be going through that as we go through, but um, first of all, let's talk about how, how we feel when we begin to feel sad. And uh, so the first slide here you see, it says, most of the time I don't have much fun. The rest of the time I don't have any fun at all. And lately I've been in contact with people who have this kind of attitude. And remember, we're not talking about people who are lost and have no hope. We're talking about people who are Christians, people who know, know the Word and know the principles in God's Word good enough that they ought not find themselves in this situation. They ought not find themselves being drawn down into sadness, which can lead to, ultimately, clinical depression. And so, you know, when we 
come into contact with people in our lives and we want to talk to them about our sadnesses and um, most of the time when we get together for what many Christians will call fellowship, uh, what I tend to see happen is more of a gripe session than a fellowship. You know, if we get together and it's, you know, it's not a worship, regular worship service, or, and, or if we go to visit somebody at their house, what I see a lot of Christians doing is they end up getting into a gripe session. And that is you start to mumble and grumble about the things that are going wrong in your life, about how life isn't fair, and about the the just the way that everything you plan is has been botched and everything's going wrong. And of course, misery loves company, so we love to share that with other people. Now it's human nature that once you share what's wrong with you, the other person wants to share back. But they want to share what they what they uh, would like to do is to top the problems that you're going through. So you can say, well, this week the water heater in my or the water pump in my car went out. And the other person might say, well, that's nothing. The, the whole transmission fell out of my car this week. And we tend to get into these little gripe sessions. And these gripe sessions that we have are the result of wrong thinking. They're the result of wrong thinking. Now, where does wrong thinking come from? It comes from not being grounded in the Word of God. And it comes mostly from a lack of faith in what God can do. When we start to doubt that God is on our side and that He can do great things in our life and that He can do the impossible, no matter what it is, then we start to feel overlooked, overwhelmed. We start to feel sad. We start to get very selfish. And, you know, when we get into these gripe sessions, of course, then we have family or friends that will come to us. If you fall into that mode of depression where sadness turns to clinical depression, um, after a while, people will come around you and they'll just say, it's time to get over it. You know, same thing with grief. Um, if you're grieving a loss, there comes a point where people that come around you will basically try to tell you, hey, it's been so long. Why don't you just get over it? Why don't you just stop, stop, grieve, stop that grieving? Same thing with depression. Why don't you just stop being depressed? Well, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. Nothing about it is so simple that we can just stop feeling that way. If you feel so overwhelmed that you start to get depressed, it's not easy just to stop. In fact, most people find it impossible because what we've done is we have allowed a certain state of mind to overtake the faith that's in our heart. We have allowed what we're thinking, the way we're thinking, and really important here is what we are saying. What we say to other people has a huge impact on what ultimately happens in our own life. So we can, with confidence, I can say that biblically speaking, if we find ourselves overwhelmed with depression, that most of the time it is our own fault. 
it's our own fault. Now, a lot of people will argue with me on that point. A lot of people will say, well, how can it be my fault? These things are, have all happened outside of my control. Uh, all these things, let's take, for example, uh, a young woman who uh, thought she found a great young man and she ends up getting pregnant and not just once, but a few times, and and her young man will not marry her, does not really support her, uh, refuses to take on his responsibilities as as outlined in God's word. Um, over time, and, and then, you know, usually this man will go out and have flings and end up having babies with other women. Now, over time, that woman is going to feel pretty bad about herself, right? But nine times out of ten, these young women will say, you know, I'm overwhelmed and I feel depressed, but it's not my fault. It was that guy. Well, if you had never had sex outside of marriage, then you would have never had any children. If you would have been more picky about the guy, you know, and lined him up with the standards that are in God's Word, you would have never got in a relationship with him in the first place. It's So basically what the message I'm trying to get across is our level of sadness or happiness is dependent on the choices that we make in our daily lives. Each and every choice that we make leads us either into positive territory or negative territory. And it's all according to what the Bible teaches us about how we should live our lives. And in First Corinthians, or in Excuse me. In Corinthians, the Bible tells us, I'm going to show you the verse in a second here. For those of us who are born again believers, for those of us who are Christians, the Bible tells us that we walk by what? We walk by faith, not by, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. And that's exactly what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we who are Christians, we who are God's children, we who have been chosen and have accepted the call of Christ, we walk by faith and not by sight. So no matter what's going on in the world around us, no matter what wrongs other people have done to us, no matter what the world has thrown at us, no matter how bad the economy gets, no matter how low my paycheck checks get, no matter how much money I have in my pocket, no matter if I start losing possessions or whatever, I should never interpret that as God forsaking me or allowing myself to feel overwhelmed because of what I see going on in the world. You see, because we are ordained priests and kings in the kingdom of God, not in this world, but in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God exists right now, and it exists right here, but it's not something we can see or touch. We can feel it inside. We feel it in the spirit, but we can't smell it or see it or touch it or feel it. And therefore, we must live our lives in the kingdom of God 
totally by faith and certainly not by what we see. Because if we look around the world and we look at the events that are happening around us, the things that our people are doing to us, um, Jesus promised us that if we follow him, we will be persecuted. We know that we will be tempted. The Bible says, but with every temptation, God will provide us a way of escape. So we know we're going to be tempted. And we also know that Satan's not going to leave us alone, especially if we start to become successful as Christians. When we start to really receive the promises and the abundance that God has promised us in his word, Satan's going to be right there, ready to pounce on us and attack us at our weakest points. And... Um, for many of us, our weakest point is, of course, that we tend to become overwhelmed and fall into that area of sadness that eventually leads to depression. But what the Bible, and I'm going to give you the key before we even get into the specifics and the examples of everything, the key to getting over depression, the key of getting out of that deep sadness and once again, regaining your joy and getting excited about life again. You know, there are far, far too many people I know right now have basically resigned on life. And they tend to sit in their chair and watch television, and just the days go by. Watch television, post some stuff to Facebook, gripe on the phone to others. And this has become more prevalent as people have lost their jobs, as people's incomes have have went down and and so we have more people stuck at home you know maybe uh, and the government doesn't help because the government extended unemployment but when is it that people actually go out and look for a job if they're on unemployment they don't exactly go look for a job until the unemployment runs out. So even if somebody doesn't have a job and they don't have a great income, they will tend to just sit in their home and get sad and get overwhelmed and get stressed out and get depressed instead of actively going out and searching for a job, which is what, by faith, we should be doing. By faith, we should, if we lose our job, we should go out and search for the next job that God has in our life plan. But the government just continues to enable the people of this world and so the majority of people that don't have a job, they're going to sit at home and wait for those checks to come in until they get that notice that says the checks aren't going to come anymore. And that's when they'll go out and start looking for a job. And what we have to realize as Christians is that what we see and what we experience in life has nothing to do with reality. We tend to, as human beings, we tend to place uh, place our most our efforts mostly on what we experience in life 
we tend to react to things that happen in our life instead of being proactive, instead of making choices beforehand, acting on what we know to be right and good and honest and true. Instead of doing that, we tend to sit back and react to what the world throws at us. And this is a horrible way to live because there is no joy. There is no peace. There is no rest for the soul that just reacts to what the world seems to be throwing at us. And um, the Word of God has taught us better. Jesus taught us better. Jesus told us that we should be anxious for nothing. Jesus taught us that which one of us by worrying, by anxiety and stress, could add one inch to our height. He told us not to stress about anything, but to talk to God and with all thanksgiving and praise, give glory to Him. Be content. Paul told us to be content no matter what situation we find ourselves in. And the only way we can do that is if we know our reality is based on God's point of view and not man's point of view. If all we if all the input we take in is what other people say to us in gripe sessions, uh what we hear on the news, you know, the news is notorious for reporting 99.9% .9 of everything that is bad. Once in a while they'll report on something that is good, but most of the news that we watch on TV, most of the stuff that we read online in the form of news or media is going to be negative. And that's because that's what people are drawn to. That's the reality that most people think that they live in. This reality where life is not fair, where God doesn't really take care of them the way that He should, where God isn't really coming through with His promises the way that He promised. And that's just not true. It's just not true. And it's unfair to blame on God that which we have chosen for ourselves. If we have, as Christians have chose to ignore the kingdom of God, if we have chose not to live a life according to faith, but instead to live a life according to reaction, right? Because most people, here's how most people's minds work. I'll make a decision as soon as I have proof, the proof I need to make that decision. As soon as I get the proof I need, then I'll make my decision. Well, the proof you, that you get from the world you think you live in is going to be negative. And the decisions that we make are going to be bad. We need to make decisions based on faith. Not on what we experience. We need to look at the world through God's Word and not through our own experience, through our own mind, through our own way of thinking, and especially not in our own reality. We think the world is operating according to certain principles because mo for most of us, we want the world to revolve around us. That's not the way it works. The world was created so that God would be at the center. So that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We were created in order to fulfill the purposes of God and to give Him glory. 
That's what we were made for. We were made to love God back. And when we do not live our lives according to that standard, when we don't live our lives according to faith, then we're going to fall short and it's going to begin to affect us in an extremely negative way. And uh, so I think we'll stop here and next week um, I'll continue this dis discussion. We're going to get into um, exactly what depression is. Uh, we're going to get into... Um, everything about it uh, and we're going to go through a case study uh, with Elijah the prophet as our example of someone who is a great person of God who had a great victory but fell into the very depths of clinical depression and exactly the steps that God took to bring him out back out of that depression so, for everyone would stand, we'll be dismissed this morning.